Uh, so you've come to Hay Festival today to talk about your book Notes on a Nervous Planet, which talks a lot about um, mental health and your own experiences with mental illness. Why did you decide to be so open about this and what gave you the courage to do so? Um, yeah, it took me a long time actually. I mean, I, I've written a stupid number of books now. I've written something like 15, 16 books. And the first time I wrote about my mental health was about book 12, when I wrote a book called Reasons to Stay Alive. And um, I wouldn't have written that book if I hadn't been asked to write it. And I was asked by a friend who works in publishing who, had, who knew I had had depression and anxiety. And it was, it, was a, it was kind of a hard thing to do. But once I started writing it, it felt like a release. It felt like a really, you know, like a therapy session. It felt like a, a release and a relief to do that. And with Notes on a Nervous Planet, it's slightly less personal than Reasons to Stay Alive, because even though there's some autobiographical stuff about me having panic attacks in supermarkets and stuff like that, it's also about all of us. You know, mental health isn't just mental illness, it's about everyone with a mind, just like physical health is everyone with a body. So it, it's more general, it's more looking at society, it's more looking at 21st century living, social media, breaking news, how we sleep differently now, how we fall in love differently now, how, how every aspect of our life is different. Yet, fundamentally, our minds and our bodies are the same as they were 50,000 years ago. What first strikes me about A Nervous Planet is that it's written almost like a diary, and I was wondering why you chose to write in this more personal format. Well, for one thing, I love short chapters because I, I, I haven't got a great attention span, which is partly a result of being alive in the 21st century and being distracted by everything and being on the internet too much. Um, and also, I don't know, I've, I always feel like with the two books I've written about mental health, Notes and Reasons, that um, the reader I have in mind is myself when I was like 25 years old, when I was literally suicidal and wanting to my, throw myself off a cliff in Spain. Um, and I always wonder if there were any, was any way of breaking into that mind and hacking into that mind. And so I deliberately don't set out to write an academic book or the last word on depression or this massive sort of tome. I want it to be personal. I want it to sort of include research and stuff, but I want it to feel authentic. Because when I was ill, um, I would have taken advice better from someone who'd not necessarily gone through that, but gone through something. So I'm trying to give a little bit of the sort of pain and things I've been through to um, communicate better, I suppose. The book talks a lot about the dangers of social media and phone usage. What do you think is the most scary about social media? About social media? OK, um, well, firstly, social media isn't all universally bad. I'd say, firstly, as a caveat, there's one um, brilliant thing for mental health about social media and that is the ability to feel uh, less alone in your symptoms like 20 years ago when I had a breakdown there was no social media to speak of and it was very hard to hear about anyone who'd gone through stuff so that aspect of it is a good thing I think and that sort of sense of uh, of having your experience echoed you know, it could be someone 8,000 miles away who's gone through panic attacks similar to what you've done and stuff. And it's great for that sort of collective action around uh, issues, including mental health. Um, I, I think the danger is we don't really know. We haven't really took a step back to, to work out what exactly it's doing to us. I mean, for me, it, it feels like it's addictive. There's definitely psychological consultants who work, uh, you know, for a Silicon Valley company. So they're trying to make the product and the service as addictive as possible. And I feel like we're not aware of how much time we're spending on there. And it doesn't fundamentally satisfy our desire for uh, community and friendship. You know, the most connected generation there has ever been, which is the sort of under 26 generation now, is also the loneliest. In surveys after surveys, it's the loneliest generation. Yet they're the ones with, you know, superficially the most friends, the most contacts, more connected than ever before. And I think we're absolutely overloaded to, with, with news, with information, but also with people. You know, the, the numbers have grown so much. There's a, oh, I'm going to forget his name, Roger Dunbar, there's a clever uh, guy from Oxford University who came up with Dunbar's number, which is 150. And 150 was the size of the average um, B 
village in the Doomsday Book. It was the size of the average village in Europe up until the end of the 18th century. It was the size of the average hunter-gatherer community. And so they, he's come up with his number 150 is what, you know, the amount of people you're meant to meaningfully know in a lifetime. Whereas now with something like Instagram, you could encounter 150 new people before you're even out of bed. So everything, yeah, all these numbers have um, grown, but our minds haven't grown. We, it's like we're really old, outdated hardware trying to run the software of modern life and we keep on crashing all the time. How do you think as a society we can use social media responsibly and do you have any tips for young people using social media? I think awareness is always, you know, the first, because I think, like with me, I, 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 was, I didn't realise how much time I was spending on there. And as soon as you sort of, like, monitor that, you sort of scare yourself into spending less time on there. You know, I was spending some, day, some days, I was like nine hours on all, across all sort of social media platforms and WhatsApp and everything. And that is, I don't want to spend, you know, that percentage of my life digitally online. And so it's just forcing yourself away from it. With me, I, I do things like I walk the dog without and leave my phone. Just have some tiny amount of time where my, I can't, don't even have the option to check my phone. I charge my phone um, in the bathroom now. I'm still massively addicted to it and I still get embroiled in Twitter and stuff. So I have to physically remove myself from it. And also I don't, I don't um, hate follow people anymore. I used to sort of go, like certainly on Twitter, I would seek out people to be angry at and you know, in some sort of masochistic way to get offended by something. And I don't do that anymore because it's just, why? You write um, fiction books as well um, and your latest is a children's book inspired by your daughter. And um, what can you tell us about it? Yes, Evie and the Animals was inspired by my, by my daughter Pearl who said, she wanted me to write a book about animals and a girl who spoke to animals. So it's that. She's a kind of Dr. Doolittle, but it's all telepathic communication with, with animals and certain animals she can communicate with better. So she's got this skill that's developing and her dad says she has to keep it secret. And he doesn't fully explain why. He doesn't want to give much information, but he says you have to never use this skill. It's very, very dangerous. And it led to the death of your mother and you can't do anything about it and uh, then becomes a situation where she has to um, use it and then all kinds of trouble ensues and then all the animals in the town where she lives go missing and then there's a subplot about the Amazon rainforest and it was just me having fun but also exploring themes of environmentalism and um, environmental destruction and all that fun stuff but in a sort of kids adventure story. Oh, that sounds brilliant. Uh, thank you very much thank for you. speaking to us today.